I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, was not a promise made to the nation of Israel. It's a promise made to Abraham. Abraham is not only the father of Judaism, Abraham is the father of Islam and Christianity. You know, the world can be a really confusing place these days. We all hate terrorism. We hate people being marginalized. We hate innocent civilians being killed in war. And we're in these binary times where people demand you be on one side of something or another, and particularly when it comes to the Middle East and that territory known as Palestine. That's where the country of Israel exists, and, and it's in a very difficult relationship with those in Gaza and the West Bank. Many Christians are told we're biblically commanded to support Israel no matter what they do because the Bible is clear. But is it? Let's think about it. Let's talk about it. Let's not be scared to delve into it a little bit on this edition of Bible Talk. We're talking today about the fact that in war, like we're seeing in the Middle East right now, each side believes God is on their side. Every war the United States has ever fought, we have believed was God-endorsed, providential, part of a, a manifest destiny. Um, and so just want to know your thoughts on that as we talk about the Middle East. What we're hearing a lot from Christians is, well, the Bible says you have to stand with Israel or you'll be cursed. And that was something that we were taught continuously when I was growing up in an Assemblies of God church. And then one day I, I read the Bible and, and that's a dangerous thing to do because when I read the Bible, uh, all of a sudden I realized that that verse, I believe it's Genesis 12, 3, that says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, was not a promise made to the nation of Israel. It's a promise made to Abraham, not to the nation of Israel. And I'm not saying God doesn't like Israel, don't hear me wrong. I'm just saying when Christians use that passage to say, I'm with Israel no matter what they do. They have impunity. They have $3 billion of U.S. aid every year, and they can do anything they want with it because God tells us if we stand with Israel, we'll be blessed as a nation which I, I have sort of pushed back on my Christian friends and, I, I, and said, I, I, thought you, I thought you thought America was God's favorite nation. I thought you thought America first because God loves America more than anything. But the promise of Genesis 12, 3 to anybody who can read is a promise made to Abraham. And Abraham is not only the father of Isaac, who is then the father of Jacob, whose name was uh, changed to Israel and is generally considered the father of the nation of Israel. Abraham was also the father of Ishmael. That's right. Abraham raped a slave girl and planned to steal her child as his own and give it to his wife. And then he decided uh, he would send them off to their death in the desert. And God saved Ishmael and Hagar in the desert and then made huge promises to Ishmael. So Abraham is not only the father of Israel and Judaism, Abraham is the father of Ishmael and Islam. And Christianity considers itself an offspring from Judaism. Therefore, Abraham is also the father of Christianity. So to say that Genesis 12, 3 says we are to favor Israel over anybody because God told us to in the book of Genesis is a severe twisting and misuse of the Hebrew text of the Bible. And that's 
a really important thing as you know and somebody said oh in psalm it says pray for jerusalem and it's a it's a psalm that is specifically for the people of their people group yes jerusalem was their home they felt and they had to pray for that so when we're looking at the middle east war that's going on and we hear that israel has started moving into gaza some with their defense force I understand why people are saying the, you know, Israel has a right to respond to uh, what many would say is terrorism and, and beheadings and all of the, the horrifying things for sure. I believe it should be a measured response. I should be, I believe it should be a response that's actually intended to correct the problem going after Hamas and not just, oh, this is our chance to really go in and harm Gaza. There's a danger in saying God is on our side in a war. Every war in history has been fought by two people groups who believed God, whatever their version of God was, was endorsing their battle. In fact, let me play something for you. Mike Johnson the new Speaker of the House, said it wasn't the voting of the Republicans that made him Speaker of the House. It was God. I believe that Scripture, the Bible, is <clears throat> very clear that, that God is the one that raises up those in authority. He raised up each of you. And I believe that God has ordained and allowed each one of us to be brought here for this specific moment in this time. This is my belief. So you heard that Mike Johnson is saying, God raised me up into this position. And I'm here because God wants me to be here. And there's a real danger of saying God is on our side in this conflict. If you're on YouTube, you can see this picture and it is a picture of a belt buckle. It says, God meant uns. A belt buckle from a German soldier in World War II. And we know the four letter word that starts with N and has a Z in it. That is uh, a name for those soldiers. And the belt buckle worn by that soldier says, Gott mit uns, which is German for God with us. That's right. The German soldiers of World War II wore belt buckles that said, God with us. Everybody believes God is on their side in a conflict. And really bad end times teaching has told Christians two things that we're seeing in action right now, that they have to support Israel no matter what Israel does. Even though we would say to any other country that we give $3 billion a year in aid to, to help pay for their governments, that they need to meet some standards and we have some rights to make demands from them. The second thing a lot of Christians are thinking is like, yes, this is it. We get war in Israel and we get to go to heaven and then laugh at everybody who we consider a lost soul. It's such an interesting thing that the Christians who are saying, I have to stand with Israel no matter what, or I'll be cursed by God, would also say that those Israeli Jewish people who are killed in this horrible tragedy will not be in heaven. How can you have such a dichotomous belief? But when you're taught to believe lies, it becomes fairly easy to believe them. And when you go to a Sunday morning indoctrination gathering once a week and are taught that once there's war in Israel, Jesus is going to come out of the sky. So stand with Israel, but hope they get attacked by all the countries of the world. And if they die, they're not going to go to heaven because they haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, despite the fact that Abraham, David, Enoch, Elijah, Jacob, none of them accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So when Mike Johnson says, God puts everyone in authority, he quoted in the House of Representatives of the United States of America, a passage that says, God puts all authority in place which I won't even go into the fact that then that assumes that Xi Jinping and, and uh, the North Korean leader were put in place by God. But it misses the fact that Mike Johnson 
was part of trying to overturn the 2020 election. Mike Johnson does not believe that God put Joe Biden in authority. Mike Johnson only believes that God puts people from his own party in authority. He would never quote that verse in relation to Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi or Gavin Newsom. I hope you're enjoying this conversation and you let your defenses down a little bit rather than jumping to a binary conclusion on one side or the other. That's what I really want to do is give people permission to think, to think differently than the indoctrination they've been given. And I love doing it. Help me do that by joining the Pastor Paul community at our website at pastor-paul.com. If you're able to do even $5.99 donation per month. It's a big help to help spread our message to the world that God is not mad at us. And in this next year, I'm, I have some pretty cool plans. Just go to pastor-paul.com and at least sign up for the Inspire You newsletter that comes via email regularly. You can ask me questions and join in on the community chat board, but I'm going to be sharing a lot of my story there in the coming months. So I hope you'll do it pastor-paul.com. I will love you no matter what. Uh, also follow my social media on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Now let's get back to our discussion on Abraham, Israel, and the major religions of the world and the conflict in the Middle East on this edition of Bible Talk. Which brings us to Jenna Ellis this week, one of Trump's attorneys, and many of his attorneys are now sharing that they lied about election interference. And let's hear Jenna Ellis, Christian, tell about the 2020 lie of Donald Trump. As an attorney who is also a Christian, I take my responsibilities as a lawyer very seriously, and I endeavor to be a person of sound moral and ethical character in all of my dealings. I relied on others, including lawyers with many more years of experience than I, to provide me with true and reliable information. What I did not do, but should have done, was to make sure that the facts the other lawyers alleged to be true were in fact true. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. I look back on this whole experience with deep remorse. It's not so strange that American Christians so easily believe lies. As a Christian, I was taught to believe lies and to be taught easily to believe lies by conspiracy theories. Like when we were told the European Union would be the new Rome talked about in the book of Daniel and would have 10 countries, we then Jesus to. would come. There's 27 The European Union now has EU 27 now. countries and Jesus hasn't come. Like when we were told the barcode was the mark of the beast. That was a lie. Beware of it. It was not the mark of the beast. It does not contain the number 666 and Jesus yet has to return. Correct. Like when we were told Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist because Ronald Wilson Reagan had six letters in each of those Christian three names. Lie. And Maryland in its state lottery had the winning number 666 on his election day. Jesus is coming but even though some may think so, Ronald Reagan was not the Antichrist and Jesus did not come. Or when we were told the formation of Israel in 1948 meant this was the last generation Another on earth lie. and a generation lasts 40 years. Therefore, Jesus is coming in 1988. Last I looked, 1988 is past and Jesus has not come back. But Jenna Ellis was not humble in her work for Donald Trump. She tried to take power everywhere she went. She once declared herself a hot conservative, and she was certain she was right and doing God's bidding on earth in working for Donald Trump. Because sadly, people like Jenna Ellis and me are taught we are in a religious sect that has all truth and everybody else is wrong. And those wrong, evil people are going to persecute you no. whenever you tell the truth of the Bible. So no matter how many times somebody comes and says, what you were told has proven to not be true, that's proven persecution. True. And you just keep going forward, even though the lies clearly are lies. I'm going to give Jenna Ellis the benefit of the doubt when she said she wanted to be Not a person of integrity are. and character. But sadly, Christianity takes those monitors of self away from Christian people. It doesn't matter for Christians if 
Bill Barr, the most partisan attorney general on, on either side in my lifetime and says election fraud is bullshit. It doesn't matter that Ivanka Trump says that it's not true. It doesn't matter that Sidney Powell Trump's uh, uh, Trump's attorney went into court and said her defense was no reasonable person would have believed anything she said. It doesn't matter that Jenna Ellis is now in court going, I'm a Christian, which somehow is supposed to give you credibility in today's America. Hardly. Christianity in America now means you get to do all kinds of horrible, evil things and claim God endorsed you to do it. But even Christian Jenna Ellis saying, if I knew what I do knew now, I wouldn't work for Donald Trump. Mark Meadows, the closest in to Trump on January 6th, the one that set up the phone call, the very illegal phone call to Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, is now turning against Trump and saying he told Trump on numerous occasions that Trump needed to stop telling the lie about the 2020 election. And he says Trump went out on election night knowing he was lying about the outcome of the election and lied about it. Ask yourself, if you're a Christian, why is it that you believe Trump and anybody who says all hail Trump and you, anybody who says Trump's lying, you say, oh, they're incredible. They're, they're terrible. That's really scary to live in a life where there is one man who can tell you that. When, you're, when people are able to use the Bible to twist your politics, that is the definition of taking God's name in vain, that of, of using God, just like those German soldiers did in World War II with belt buckles that says, Gott mit uns, that says, God is with us. That's right. Just saying God's on our side, this is what the Bible says, doesn't make it so. And the fact that you all can't even question what's being said, what you're being told when those who are closest into Trump are now saying loudly, it is not true. And you still say, well, and I really believe if Donald Trump came out tomorrow and said, it's a lie, so Christians would say, oh, this is, this is part of his plan. This is part of his plan because you've been groomed and trained to believe lies. So when the Middle East conflict comes up, we say, oh, God says we have to stand with Israel. So our hearts with Israel, we're praying for Israel. And you don't feel any need to care about anybody else in the struggle. And yet, anybody in the Israeli Defense Force who is Jewish that is killed, you believe, will not be in heaven with you. It's really, I mean, it's it's scary. And I was reading the other day a definition of a democracy that's in trouble, a, a, the definition of a democracy that is in demise from, the, <laughs> Kevin just says, Biden has blinded you. <laughs> see, the, the funny thing about that statement is, is see, right-wingers are so, have so much fealty to Trump and worship him in such ways as being a messiah to them that they believe everybody else does that too. They believe that if you're not for Trump, you have the same fealty and, and Joe Biden flags flying out in front of your house. No, we don't worship men like you do. We're not trained to fall in line with what we're told to do. We're not trained to watch specific media that tells us what to think and what to recite. We're trained to think and consider and argue and say, is that right or not? And so when a, a conflict comes up between Israel and the Palestinians, and by the way, there are many Christian Palestinians. I, I keep going on these rabbit trails. I heard a, a Palestinian Christian on a podcast the other day, and it was interesting that the podcaster was being very honest. And he's like, you know, many of us don't even think there are 
uh, Christian Palestinians. And this man lived in the West Bank in uh, Bethlehem. And he said, um, you wouldn't be a Christian if it wasn't for my ancestors. My ancestors were the Christians that brought the gospel to Europe and to you, that you, if it wasn't for Palestinian Christians, you would not be a Christian. <laughs> and that's a stunning statement. And it's incredible that Christians in America today are unable to see that, you know, if God is who you say God is, then God loves everybody involved in this. Jesus said, if you only love those who are like you, if you only love your family and those who are on your side, how are you any better than the worst people in your culture, those you think who are the worst? Why does it not scare you that there's one man in all the world that you believe and nobody else? A democracy that is in trouble of becoming a non-democracy, and this has been true through history. We've seen a lot of democracies disappear through history. Is And I probably will forget some of the list, but first it was an eroding of trust in the institutions of the country. So uh, eroding trust in government, uh, eroding trust in the banking system, eroding trust in the, in the systems, rather than like, hey, let's fix them. So you erode trust, and then you say, nobody has truth except me. You deride any media that says anything negative about you. You, you say, anybody who turns, anybody who says anything negative about you that used to be on your side, you say, oh, they're bitter. You know, don't listen to them. It, it, is a, it is a strong man who steps up and says, only I have truth for you. Those institutions you can't trust, the media you can't trust, your own family that says something different than I say, you can't trust. Only I am to be believed. Uh, those are the second things of a, a democracy in trouble. Um, chaos begins to be sown and violence is endorsed. A, a, a strong man who wants to get rid of democracy and take over will endorse violent groups um, just like the brown shirts in 1930s Germany, create chaos, create violence, make people scared and say, I am the person who can save you. You uh, endorse proud boys uh, like the, the mayoral candidate in Franklin, Tennessee, and you, you endorse their tactics of intimidation and violence. Um, you erode trust. I, I mentioned you erode trust in the institutions and, and voting, eroding trust in voting. So I, I will hear a lot of times I'll talk about democracy and some Christian, some right-wing Christian will say, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. And the reason they say that is in a republic, wealthy white landowners the reason we were made a republic is so wealthy white land owning slave owners could kind of set the elections aside if they didn't agree with the vote of the people. So you erode trust in voting and you start to find ways to usurp the voting of the people because you know that once you start trying to become a minority party in charge, voting is your enemy. And you hear now all the time, all the reasons Republicans try to restrict people from voting is they know they cannot win straight votes. They have to find ways to do that. So that's another way that you can tell a democracy is eroding. And this is a big one. You find a group of people to demonize and blame. You find a group to demonize and blame. Let me just think of a wild example off the top of my head. Oh, I don't know, like immigrants across the southern border, people of color, Black Lives Matter, trans people. You find a people group to demonize and you tell the group that feels they are a part of, of the status quo and the power base and you say, those people are coming to take something from you. The reason you have hard things in your life is because of those people and that strong man then says, I'm the one who can stop them. 
Does it sound like any country you know of today? And you get people who start to say, I don't believe anybody but the dear leader. I know terrorism is awful and scary. But terrorism happened in the United States. And we said, well, we have to kick somebody's ass. And the country we're pretty sure is responsible. We can't go kick their ass. See, look there, right there, Miami 1010 says, this is not a democracy. See, that's a right-wing mantra that they're told over and over and over again. And the reason you reemphasize that point, we're a republic, not a democracy, is you want the wealthy power base to be able to set aside voting. You fear the vote of the masses. And the Republicans have not won uh, a popular vote for president since um, since Clinton, other than GW's second term. They've lost every other single vote for president. Uh, they've had presidents elected because of the Electoral College, but they have not won the popular vote. And that's that's a long time to go without winning the popular vote. So right-wing media will keep emphasizing, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. And that gives wealthy, powerful people, i.e. white men, opportunity to set things aside uh, if they want to. Christian right-wingers, why are you not able to question whether your sect might have it wrong? Why are you afraid of checking yourself because you've been taught that God doesn't want you to think that might be the devil whispering in your ear. If you go to that college and start to learn and you're learning all that education, that that's the devil whispering in your ear, brother. So when any Christian tells you the Bible says we have to support Israel no matter what, and I'm not saying we shouldn't support Israel. They are uh, a, a partner in many ways in the Middle East, but that doesn't mean we give them $3 billion and carte blanche to do whatever they want at all times because God made a promise to Abraham, not to Israel, to Abraham in the Hebrew scripture. And Abraham is the father of not only Judaism, which Christians would say then begot Christianity. So they inherited all of those rights, which is a pretty anti-Semitic belief when you really think about it at the end of the day and has been a part of uh, the travesty of harming uh, Jewish people for many, you know, throughout history. But Abraham is also the father of, of Islam. So Abraham is the father of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, and therefore to say God cares about the Israelis and not about the Palestinians and not about the neighboring countries is a gross twisting of Hebrew sacred text for your own purposes. Jesus said his mission statement was, I've come to give sight to the blind. And he later talked about people who don't have eyes to see or ears to hear, so they don't know what is good and right in the season. He says, I've come to give sight to the blind, to set the captives free, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. And then he stops quoting Isaiah, where Isaiah then talks about the Lord's vengeance. And Jesus doesn't talk about the Lord's vengeance. He only talks about giving sight to the blind and setting people free. I think, I think the story of Jesus is about setting people free from the bondage of sectarian religion. That would tell you, you have to dress a certain way. You have to act a certain way. You can't love the person that you love. You have to deny your emotions and feelings. You have to consider yourself dirt and an original sinner because some guy ate a piece of fruit 6,000 years ago. Are you ever able to even think that your sect 
might not exactly have it right. Christianity has been so wrong through all of history. Why are you unable to consider that? Oh, well, maybe we're wrong about some things today. Because Jesus prophesied the leaven of that religion, taking it in, taking it in, swallowing what you're told, swallowing what you're told at church and on Fox News or OANN or whatever your outlet is, some guy's website he makes in his dad's basement, will take away your eyes to see and your ears to hear. He said, you will be under the curse of Isaiah 6, no longer a heart to understand. You won't be able to hear truth anymore. But he said, those of you who don't eat that leaven of bad, toxic, controlling, dominating religion that wants to input itself into civil code through government, those who don't fall for that get to hear the things that prophets long to hear. Isn't that incredible? So step back from the leaven of your religious sectarian religion for a while your, your politically prostituted religion and see what you might be able to see when you're no longer stuck that way. Jesus judged religious bigots who tried to impose their religion onto others, even through the civil code, who believed their job as religious people was to overthrow the government and make their country great again. That's the... the Religious leaders that Jesus called whitewashed tombs literally said, if we don't do something about Jesus, the Romans are going to come and they're going to take our religion and take our country. They were MIGA. They were make Israel great again believers. They, they had the unbelievably bad belief that God's plan was to put their religion and race and nationality in charge of the government and that God would make their country great again, and the world would be set right when their country was the economic and military power of the world. And that is exactly what MAGA believes. When God wants to put our religion in charge of the country, we're God's favorite country in America, and once, we're, once Christianity is in charge of the government, and we are the economic and military power of the world, Things will be right in the world, and God will make our country great again. And every time Jesus was offered that option to endorse that type of belief system, he ran from it and said, hell no, I will not partake of that. I was an American history minor. I, I love this country's history, but I love it when we're honest about it. And when we look at it in its full rawness, I think it's an amazing thing that happened here. The other part of when democracy is, is in trouble, when you no longer allow your history to be taught in truth, but try to literally whitewash your history as Ron DeTrumpus does down in Florida. And my heart grieves. There's a, there's a book in Hebrew scripture called Lamentations where Jeremiah laments that his people are listening to false prophets and they, and they like it that way. And, and that's my feeling today is I lament for what Christianity has become in America. Declaring ourselves more righteous than others because we vote to ban abortion, despite the Bible never once declaring that to be an attribute of a Christian but reveling in our complete disgust for the true commands of the Bible. To love your neighbor as yourself. Totally ignoring when Jesus says, 
Those who inherit the kingdom are those who clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and visit the prisoner in prison. That over 2,000 times in the Hebrew scripture and the Christian New Testament, we're told to seek justice, not just give a backpack to or a turkey leg on Thanksgiving to, but seek justice for the poor, the foreigner, the outcast or the marginalized, like the Samaritans of that day, like the LGBTQ+, like those of non-Christian religions in America today, and to the widow, which meant those who don't have the same access to the economic system as, as you do. So I apologize to all my Christian friends out here today, particularly in TikTok land, for actually talking about the Bible rather than about your prost uh, politically prostituted version of Jesus, your white American Jesus. You've heard truth now and you're responsible to it. And I'm sorry to put you in that place. Hear me, Christians. Saul of Tarsus was the best Bible student in the best Bible school with the best Bible teacher in the center of biblical studies of the world. And he got the Bible 100% wrong. He believed the exact opposite of what it was actually telling him. Is there any chance at all, any chance at all, that you may be a little off in your beliefs. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to the age that you're in, but be transformed. That means to be completely changed by the ongoing renewing of your mind so that you can know what is good and right. That verse is saying you have to continually renew your mind. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that is proceeding from the mouth of God. You have to be constantly checking your beliefs or you will become hard-hearted. And right now, this hard-hearted political religion you guys are following has stolen your humanity and stolen your ability to love people and to follow the commands of the Bible. It's stolen your ability to love yourself. And so you cannot participate in the command that Jesus said. He didn't say, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, these are the two commands that encompass everything. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. If it wasn't for Palestinian Christians, nobody of European descent, nobody of Western Hemisphere descent would be a Christian today. Those Palestinians that you hate, God may not hate them quite as much as you do. And I encourage you to be willing to, maybe just even for a second, take the opportunity to think, to look in the mirror and say, am I sure my sect has it all right because we've been wrong before and even those german soldiers in world war ii had belt buckles that said got mit uns god with us just because you're told god is on your side just because you think god is on your side doesn't mean god is on your side. The comfy pew of certainty, as I said in my Inspire You email today, is the enemy of true life. And when you start to choose the comfort of certainty to believe what you're told by one church and literally today by one man, 
that ought to be a red flag that makes you scared and say, oh, bleep. How did I get myself indoctrinated and blinded by dogma? I hope one day, like Saul of Tarsus, the scales can fall from your eyes and you can meet the real Jesus, not the white American patriotic one you've been taught about in your church so that you can know what is good and right. Thanks for joining. Please like and follow my page and all that good stuff and go to my website, pastor-paul.com. You can get a free copy of an ebook, Five Important Steps to Rethinking Your Faith, and also find out about my mentorship and coaching projects on there and how you can join in. Go check it out and please like and follow my page on TikTok and YouTube and Facebook. And we'll see you all again soon. Love you all.